Welcome to chapter four, growth, diversity, and conflict. Let's get started. New England's Freehold Society. Let's look at the farm families and women in the household economy. Men claim power in the state and authority in the family. Women, therefore, were subordinate. Women in the colonies were raised to be dutiful helpmates to their husbands. The labor of the Puritan women was crucial to the rural household economy. Bearing and rearing children were equally crucial tasks. Most women married in their early 20s and by their early 40s had given birth to six or seven children. More women than men attended the churches. Most New England women's lives were tightly bound by a web of legal and cultural restrictions. They were excluded from an equal role in the church. Now let's look at farm property and inheritance. Men who migrated to the colonies escaped many traditional constraints, including the lack of land. Parents with small farms who could not provide their sons and daughters with land placed them as indentured servants. When indentures ended, some propertyless sons climbed from laborer to tenant to freeholder. Children in successful farm families received a marriage portion when they were in their early 20s. Parents chose their children's partners because the family's prosperity depended on it. Brides relinquished ownership of their land and property to their husbands. Fathers had a cultural duty to provide inheritances for their children. But the freehold society is going to be in crisis. With each generation, the population of New England doubled mostly from natural increase. Parents had less land to give their children, so they had less control over their children's lives. By using primitive methods of birth control, many families were able to have fewer children. Families petitioned the government for land grants and hacked new farms out of the forests. Land was used more productively Crops of wheat and barley were placed on high-yielding potatoes and corn. They're actually replaced by them, by high-yielding potatoes and corn. Gradually, New England changed from a grain to a livestock economy. A system of community exchange helped preserve the freehold ideal. Diversity in the Middle Colonies Economic growth, opportunity, and conflict. Let's look at Tennessee and New York. Fertile lands and opportunity for prosperity attracted migrants from the Middle Atlantic, and profits from grain exports financed their rapid, rapid settlement. The manorial lords of New York's fertile Hudson River Valley attracted tenants by granting long leases and the right to sell their improvements such as barns and houses, to the next tenant. Inefficient farm implements kept most tenants from saving enough to acquire freehold farmsteads. Now there's going to be conflict in the Quaker colonies. Rural Pennsylvania and New Jersey were initially marked by relative economic equality. Unable to gain land on legal terms owing to mass immigration, Many newcomers became squatters, settling illegally on land they hoped to eventually acquire legally. To deal with increased demands for land, the Penn family claimed more land than they rightfully owned from Indians by exploiting an old, and probably fraudulent, Indian deed to over a million acres of prime farmland north of Philadelphia. This purchase soured their relationship with the Delaware and Shawnee tribes. Philadelphia grew rapidly and offered opportunity to unskilled as well as skilled laborers. The rise of the wheat trade and an influx of poor settlers created social divisions, 
resulting in a new class of agricultural capitalists. By the 1760s, one half of all white men in the middle colonies owned no property. The other thing to look at too, as New England went from a, a grain to a livestock economy, upstate New York and Pennsylvania picked up on that economy. So you'll see the different regions will change what they're growing agriculturally um, to cut, not offset each other, it's just an, as, as a necessity. So cultural diversity. Many immigrants married within their own ethnic groups. So let's look at the German influx. The middle colonies were a patchwork of ethnically and religiously diverse communities. Migrants tried to preserve their cultural identities by marrying within their own ethnic groups. Quakers, the dominant social group in Pennsylvania and western New Jersey, were pacifists who believed in local governance, participatory government, and social equality. The Quaker vision attracted many Germans who were fleeing war, religious persecution, and poverty. Many traveled through the Redemptioner system a flexible form of indentured servitude that allowed families to negotiate their own terms upon arrival. Germans guarded their language and cultural heritage, encouraging their children to marry within the community. German immigrants in general supported Britain's German-born and German-speaking Protestant monarchs, George I and George II. Now let's look at the Scots-Irish settlers. Emigrants from Ireland formed the largest group of incoming Europeans. Some were Irish and Catholic, but most were Presbyterian Scots who had faced discrimination and economic regulation in Ireland. Thousands of Scots-Irish sailed for Philadelphia beginning in the 1720s, first moving to central Pennsylvania and southward down the Shenandoah Valley into Maryland and Virginia. The Scots-Irish also preserved their culture, holding firm to the Presbyterian faith. And if you look to the right there, one of the most famous of the Scots-Irish, who was a descendant of Scots-Irish settlers, was Andrew Jackson. Religion and politics. German ministers criticized the separation of church and state in Pennsylvania, believing the church needed legal power to enforce morality. Religious sects in Pennsylvania enforced moral behavior through communal self-discipline. Communal sanctions sustained a self-contained and prosperous Quaker community. By the 1740s, the Scots-Irish Presbyterians challenged Quaker political dominance by demanding a more aggressive Indian policy. And because of that, and the reason for that, they were a minority. Um, by the 1740s. Many German migrants opposed to the Quakers because they were denied fair representation in the assembly and wanted laws that respected their inheritance customs. Despite the region's ample opportunity for economic success, cultural and religious diversity in the Middle Atlantic prefigured the ethnic and social conflicts that would characterize much of American society in centuries to come. One other note, the Scots-Irish were very hostile towards Indians. Go back to the last slide, I won't. Um, Andrew Jackson, I guess, took that, uh, that tradition. Commerce, culture, and identity. Two major cultural movements impacted colonial America, enlightenment and pietism. So the transportation and print revolution. Improved transportation networks allowed Britain to dominate North Atlantic shipping. Although difficult and costly to construct, the colonial road network improved and greatly expanded. People, produce, finished merchandise, and information traveled along these water and land routes. In 1695, Parliament ended censorship. The resulting print revolution contributed to the Enlightenment 
and pietism. The colonies supplemented European print material by printing their own newspapers. So the Enlightenment in America. Many early Americans believed in folk wisdom, while others relied on a religion that believed the earth was the center of the universe and that God intervened directly and continuously in all kinds of human affairs. Copernicus's discovery that the earth traveled around the sun and Isaac Newton's scientific explanation of planetary movements around the sun challenged the traditional Christian perception of the universe. In the century between Newton's Principia Mathematica in 1687 and the French Revolution in 1789, the philosophers of the European Enlightenment used empirical research and scientific reasoning to study all aspects of life, including social institutions and human behavior. Enlightenment thinkers advanced four fundamental principles. First, the law-like order of the natural world. Second, the power of human reasoning. Third, the natural rights of individuals, including the right to self-government. And four, the progressive improvement of society. John Locke proposed that human lives were not fixed, but could be changed through education and purposeful action. In Locke's two treatises of government of 1690, he advanced the theory that political authority was not divinely ordained, but rather sprang from social compacts that people made to preserve their natural rights to life, liberty, and property. European Enlightenment, Enlightenment ideas began to affect colonists' beliefs about science, religion, and politics. Benjamin Franklin's contributions to commerce, cultural, culture, and identity at this time. Benjamin Franklin exemplified the American Enlightenment by founding the Pennsylvania Gazette and establishing the American Philosophical Society, as well as inventing bifocal lenses, the Franklin stove, and the lightning rod. Like several influential colonists, Franklin turned to deism, the belief that God had created the world and then allowed it to run in accordance with natural laws without his intervention. Although a former slave owner, Franklin began to question slavery. The Enlightenment added a secular dimension to colonial intellectual life. American Pietism and the Great Awakening It was very, very much heavily based on emotion. So in New England, New England revivalism. While educated Americans turned to deism, other colonists turned to pietism, which came to America with German migrants in the 1720s and sparked a religious revival. Pietism emphasized pious behavior, religious emotion, and the striving for a mystical union with God. In Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the Dutch minister, Theodore Jacob Frelinghausen, preached rousing emotional sermons to German settlers. In New England, an American-born pietist movement developed. In the 1730s, the strict Calvinist New England minister, Jonathan Edwards, restored Christian zeal to congregational churches in the Connecticut River Valley. Whitefield's Great Awakening Beginning in 1739, the compelling George Whitefield, a follower of John Wesley's preaching style, transformed local revivals into a Great Awakening. Hundreds of colonists felt the new light of God's grace and were eager to spread Whitefield's message throughout their communities. Printers published Whitefield's travel accounts, conversion narratives, and sermons and reinforced the Great Awakening. And within our readings, there will be um, Benjamin Franklin writing an account about George Whitefield. So, continuing the religious upheaval in the North, 
Conservative ministers or old lights condemned the preaching of traveling new light ministers for their emotionalism and for allowing women to speak in public. Oh, can't do that. In Connecticut, traveling preachers were prohibited from speaking to established congregations without the minister's consent. Some farmers, women and artisans, condemned the old lights as unconverted sinners. The awakening undermined support of traditional churches and challenged their tax-supported status. Separatist churches were founded that favored the separation of church and state. The awakening gave a new sense of religious authority to many colonists through its challenge to the authority of ministers and reaffirmed communal values as it questioned the pursuit of wealth. One tangible and lasting product of the awakening was the founding of colleges, including Princeton, Rutgers, Columbia, and Brown, to train ministers for various, various denominations. The true intellectual legacy of the awakening was not education for the few, but a new sense of religious and ultimately political authority among the many. And that photo, or not photo, but the illustration to the right is George Whitefield. Social and religious conflict in the South. Many African Americans and poor whites were left out by Anglican ministers. That's a note. Also, there's a Presbyterian revival where many converted in Virginia and other areas to Presbyterianism. And this diversity in religion challenged tax supported Anglican church. Okay, and that was from the last slide there. Um, on the bottom is, is, a, is a stone that marks the place where. Um, Jonathan Edwards gave his famous sinners um, in the hands of an angry God speech. And there's a, a Presbyterian church um, from that era. The Baptist insurgery, insurgery, insurgency, I wanted to read today. It focused on adult baptism or born-again Christianity. Baptism appealed to African Americans, where the Baptists had a belief where all people were equal. This is in Virginia now. The House of Burgesses made it illegal to preach to slaves without their owner's permission. You don't want to teach them how to read or think about things differently. And in my opinion, if you read the Gospels as a Christian, if you are a Christian, Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, it tends to put a damper on slavery and people being enslaved by authority. So, you know, they probably didn't want that message going out there. Just, just a thought. So the mid-century challenge, war, trade, and social conflict in the 1750s is going to be a big problem here. The French and Indian War, or in world history known as the Seven Years' War. So there's a conflict in the Ohio Valley. By 1750, French claims in the Ohio Valley had become tenuous as allied Indian tribes had either moved out of the area or had begun to associate with British traders. The Ohio Company of Virginia obtained a royal grant of 200,000 acres along the upper Ohio River, land controlled by Indians. Britain relied on the Iroquois Confederacy for trade and negotiations with other Indians. To counter Britain's movement into the Ohio Valley, the French set up a series of forts. The French seized George Washington and his men as they tried to support the Ohio Company's claim to the land the Albany Congress. To men relations with the Iroquois, who were upset that the British, French, and other Native Americans acted without Iroquois consent, the British Board of Trade called the meeting at Albany in June of 1754. 
Benjamin Franklin proposed a plan of union among the colonies to counter French expansion. The plan called for a centralized authority to manage trade, Indian policy, and colonial defense, but did not receive serious consideration at this meeting. If you look to the right, there is the join or die flag that's very famous um, that came and that was put together after the Albany Congress based on Franklin's proposal. So the Warhawks win. Although fearful of increased debt and tax burdens, members of Parliament dispatched forces to America, where they joined with the colonial militia in attacking French forts. In June 1755, British and New England troops captured Fort Beaujour and Nova Scotia, which is Acadia then, and deported 10,000 French Catholic Acadians to France, Louisiana, and the West Indies. In July, General Edward Braddock and his British and colonial troops were soundly defeated by a small group of French and Indians at Fort Duquesne. And if you look at uh, what I put, I put a uh, timeline to show the European and North American wars and how they coincided with each other in the late 17th into the mid 18th century. The Great War for Empire. By 1756, the fighting in America had spread to Europe, where it arrayed France, Spain, and Austria against Britain and Prussia in a conflict known as the Seven Years' War in Europe and the French and Indian War in the colonies. William Pitt, a committed expansionist, planned to cripple France by attacking its colonies. The fall of Quebec the heart of France's American empire, was the turning point in the war. The British ousted French traders from India, seized French territory in West Africa, as well as the sugar islands of Martinique and Guadalupe, and won Cuba and the Philippines from Spain. The Treaty of Paris of 1763 granted British sovereignty over half the continent of North America. French territory was reduced to a handful of islands in the West Indies and two islands off the coast of Newfoundland. Britain's victory alarmed Indian peoples, who feared an influx of Anglo-American settlers. In 1763, the Ottawa Chief Pontiac led a group of loosely confederated tribes in a major uprising known as Pontiac's Rebellion against the British. The Indian alliance gradually weakened and they accepted the British as their new political fathers. In return, the British established the Proclamation Line of 1763, barring settlers from going west of the Appalachians, which we know is going to cause a lot of problems for the British authorities. British Industrial Growth and the Consumer Revolution Britain had unprecedented, unprecedented economic resources, and by 1750, its combination of strong commerce and industry made it the most powerful nation in the world. The new machines and business practices of the Industrial Revolution allowed Britain to sell goods at lower prices, particularly in the mid mainland colonies. Americans paid for British imports by increasing their exports of wheat, rice, and tobacco. This increased trade resulted in a consumer revolution that raised the living standard of many Americans. The first American spending binge landed many colonists in debt. The loss of military subsidies prompted an economic recession. Through the increase of transatlantic trade, Americans had become more dependent on overseas creditors and international economic conditions. The struggle for land in the East. The growth of the colonial population caused conflicts over land, particularly in Pennsylvania and Connecticut. Settlers from the two colonies asserted their claims by burning down their rivals' houses and barns. It's nice. 
Wappinger Indians, Massachusetts migrants, and Dutch settlers all tried to claim manor lands in the Hudson River Valley. Mob violence erupted but was quashed by local sheriffs, manorial bailiffs, and British troops. English aristocrats in New Jersey and the southern colonies successfully asserted legal claims to land based on outdated charters. Proprietary power increased the resemblance between rural societies in Europe and America. Tenants and freeholders looked westward for cheap freehold land near the Appalachian Mountains. Western rebels and regulators. Let's look at the South Carolina regulators. Movement to the Western frontier created new disputes over Indian policy, political representation, and debts. In Pennsylvania, Scots-Irish demands for the expulsion of Indians and the ensuing massacre led by the Paxton Boys left a legacy of racial hatred and political resentment. In 1763, landowning vigilantes known as the South Carolina Regulators demanded greater political rights, local courts, and fairer taxes. Although they gained a few concessions, such as new courts and lower document fees, they failed to wrest power from the Eastern elite. Civil strife in North Carolina. In 1766, a more radical regulator movement arose in the backcountry of North Carolina, caused by plummeting tobacco prices that forced debt-ridden farmers into court. To save their farms, debtors joined with the regulators to intimidate judges, close courts, and free their comrades from jail. The regulators demanded lower fees and taxes as well as greater representation in the assembly. The royal governor mobilized the eastern militia against the regulator force, which resulted in the defeat of the regulators and the execution of their leaders. Tied to Britain, yet growing resistant towards its control, America had the potential for independent existence. British policies will play a crucial role in determining the future direction of the maturing colonies. So a quick recap. The middle colonies, especially Pennsylvania, were ethnically and religiously diverse. Enlightenment ideas changed society and encouraged individuals to question authority. The First Great Awakening created religious diversity and questioned traditional authority. See a pattern here? The French and Indian or Seven Years War removed France from North America and ended salutary neglect. That's going to be a problem. The Paxton boys and regulators demonstrated tensions between East and West. That is the end of Chapter 4. And until next time. Thanks for watching.